want to say uh, thanks uh, for being invited to being effectively the opening band uh, for this event. Uh, I kind of hope that uh, you know, as the opening band, you all find me ultimately um, interesting, but unremarkable and forgettable. Uh, in, in exchange for the, the following act, which is going to be where the real meat comes. Um, so, you know, wrote this talk about um, the brief history of managing at Reddit, and as I was writing it, I realized that a better title would have been a brief history of managing at Reddit. Um, it's been a it's been a long 14 years, uh, <laughs> and so uh, quick thing about me, uh, I'm actually uh, I'm also Reddit's f uh, first employee. I had a I started off my career in uh, in science doing physics. Um, have basically done my entire career in startups uh, and enjoying that. Uh, did, a, did a tour of duty through the travel space uh, at Hipmunk. And so um, really kind of bookmarking my career at Reddit, it's, it's, been, a, it's been a fun experience. Um, I'm just kind of curious, how many people here actually use Reddit? Okay, it's a technical crowd. I'll skip through the next couple of slides, not important. Um, uh, I'd say that one thing to, to, to think about us is that we're kind of a big deal. Um, we've got a fair amount of traffic. Uh, I like to think of us as kind of the biggest little site that no one's ever heard of. Um, I think this is a, a very technically focused group, and so we're probably you know pretty pretty common among you all. Um, but this talks more about how do we get here, and um, you know kind of going back to the early days. Um, the thing that's been most interesting about Reddit is that discovering retrospectively that Reddit is this case of like a magical product market fit before people called it a product market fit. Uh, and you know, we, we had in the early days a very small team, and we were consistently doubling. And so we were doubling every three months. I was the first guy doing traffic analytics, and it was actually really harrowing to be able to see in the week over week graphs. You could see the actual slope in the in the trend. Um, and you know, so we kind of spent most of those years uh, just kind of keeping the keeping the wheels on. Uh, and um, unlike most companies, we actually are we're post acquired, post spun back out. And so we got acquired early on in 2006 when we were still a startup of only 18 months old. Um, we didn't raise our Series A until 2012. So um, the, 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 the effect of this on us is that our employee growth was a little bit different from most companies in that um, we, up until about 2011, we only had about four engineers uh, on the entire team. Um, and actually, the funny thing about this graph is uh, that the, uh, the axis actually should go all the way to the edge. It starts in 2008 we, when we started keeping, keeping a tally. So um, if you map this in terms of uh, the amount of traffic each engineer has to deal with, it looks like this, which is a kind of a rather terrifying runaway curve um, that uh, you know, kinda, kind of explains a little bit of our initial way to operate, which is that you know, when you only have about five engineers and you're constantly kind of fighting fires, um, managers, pff, what's a manager for? I know what to do. The site's down. I have to go fix it. Uh, and another thing, PMs, like somebody's going to come in and tell you what to do. Like, we know what to do. We've got to keep the site running. Um, and I think the last little bit is that um, you know, there's, there's been a lot of lore written about the mythos of the 10x engineer. Here's a picture of a 10x engineer. They stop bullets. Um, uh, I think the 100x engineer repels the bullets back. Uh, and you know, the, the, thing, <laughs> the thing with 10x engineers is that they're really compatible with working in a startup. Right? Th this is a person who's self-driven. They don't need to be pointed. They will go and get things done. And they are also um, you know, generally, in my experience, unmanageable and amanageable, or at least you have to kind of figure out the right kind of niche for them. So um, you know, the, the side effect of all of this is you know, the, first, the first thing we ended up with is in a land without PMs, this is what our product looked like. It actually works. I mean, I really, I really have a lot of affinity. It's like a baby picture of my child. Um, but uh, you know, we kind of think we could do, do much better. Um, and then, so following 2010, we had kind of an, inter, an interregnum, or another way to describe it would be an interfounderum. Um, we all kind of disappeared and went off and did other startups, uh, and then kind of came back in 16. And um, you know, the, the, um, the company size from 16 on has actually been the thing that's been up and to the right. Um, we've been doubling uh, pretty consistently for the last couple of years. Um, we're up to a, about a 500 employee base right now. Um, you know, pre Pre-2010, the employee uh, org structure looked like a box, which is we had a couple engineers doing things. Um, shortly thereafter, we had enough people who could actually say, like, oh, yeah, you specialize in front end, you specialize in back end, and we'll, we'll kind of work it out. Uh, and that works, that works for a while until you actually start getting more people in, and your org chart starts to look like this. Right? So here is like the, this is an extreme case of the layer cake and candles model, if you're familiar with it, you know, deciding on vertical versus horizontal teams. Um, why, not, why not both? Uh, and uh, you know, this is where you actually not have, you have teams that have to coordinate, and you have people who have ideas of what they should be doing, which might be different from what they're supposed to be doing. Uh, and, and that's where you know, one, of the, one, of the, one of the first things we had to kind of settle up on is, what is the role of a CTO versus a VP of Edge? Um, and I think that everyone has a slightly different take on this, and that's fine. 
where you know, your company, companies uh, have to decide kind of what the roles are. The way that we've kind of divvied it up is that um, both of them have to be technical. Uh, you know, a VP of Eng engineering is in the name, so you should be, you should be an engineer. Um, but the VP of Eng focus is mostly on the execution side. Whereas the, the, the CTO is more on kind of the architecture side. Um, a crasser way to say it is you know, the VP of Eng also has to really, really heavily be a manager, like has to be in charge of running directors, running teams. Um, I am dressed in my official CTO hoodie today, so I'm choosing that role. Um, but you know, I think that the, the other thing, though, is that at a certain scale, both jobs are about people, right? I love to write code. I don't get a chance to write code. It's really inefficient for me to write code. I cause more problems than I'm worth writing code. Um, I am mostly working on getting myself out of the stack. And um, so I think to some extent, you know, the, the important thing about managers is that you should think of yourself as being basically meta engineers, um, which I think makes me like a meta to the end engineer, which is a terrifying thought. Um, and uh, one of my running jokes is that the, the T in CTO actually stands for therapy, uh, which really is probably more of what I spend my time on. Um, so there's a couple lessons, um, you know, just kind of in, in no particular order. Um, this is one that uh, I, I have stolen from Alex Lay, our VP of product, which has just become really important uh, over the years, which is process becomes culture. And so what, I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, so it doesn't just mean that by repeating the same thing over and over again, you will achieve change. Um, it's kind of like the, you know, the brave new world repeating to become a fact. This is more about making sure that as you set up processes that are straightforward and that are consistent, they will just become the way people operate. And so you will affect change over time because it's just the way things are done. And once you've gotten to the point where it's the way things are done, you've affected the culture. And so, and so really, about setting up, with setting up processes, we think about it as trying to set up what's the minimum viable process you can set up to actually affect the change you want. Uh, and to, to accept the fact that any process you're going to put in place is going to be imperfect and to iterate it. Uh, and so as you're kind of tweaking the process, you're kind of, kind of massaging the culture. And there's a long time for that to kind of set in. Um, Another thing that's really, I think, a big deal is the importance of values. Now, the hard part about writing this talk is that I had to get a little bit like, kind of nostalgic and retrospective. And so I got a chance to think about what I would have said if I had seen this slide as myself in 20, 2008. And my thought was, values, like, oh, it's going to be like a management wonk talk. Great. Um, Actually, like, really super important. Like, this is probably one of the most important things as a leader that you can work on. Uh, and you know, treat this as like a meta lesson from a meta engineer um, that you know, kind of in the mythical man month notion, like part of the purpose of management is that you are connectors and you're cutting down on the number of hops between people. So you're basically making this n squared communication problem simpler. And so distillation of values is like another version of effectively how to convert important bits of information into what amount to being memes, like short circuits for conversations of, we don't do X because we have this value. Um, and you know, another way to think about it is, to some extent, a company itself is just a giant legal construct. And laws are just ideas. Um, well, not just ideas, they're enforceable ideas, but they're ideas. And so having the hearts and minds of your employees is really about having them think about values as a way to enable the company to be and to be co coherent. Um, I should have opened this talk with a disclaimer, of course, though, which is that beware of physicists peddling in metaphysics. So uh, <laughs> getting a little weighty here with the, with the, with the philosophy. Um, so another, another bit about values is that, you know, in the same way that software is a living document, values should be treated as kind of a living document. And this doesn't mean that all values are necessarily going to be, going to be changeable, but it does mean they fall into classes. And so if you think about it, you kind of have like three broad classes of values. There's the straightforward implicit values, which are the ones you don't have to say, right? We don't steal. We don't embezzle. We act generally in good faith. Um, you know, if, if those are a problem, those are like, you shouldn't be existing in society. Uh, it, there's, there's the next stage, which is like the ones that are core to the company that you treat as immutable. Um, and those are going to be somewhat tied to your mission, but also just kind of tied to what you really want to emphasize going forward for, forever. Like whether or not people are living it, people should be living these. And the ones we have actually are, are two big ones, which is remember the human, which is, which is a statement both of the employees and of the fact that we're a community site with a bunch of people, uh, and evolve, which is just to say, continue to change. Like, there's no, there's no stability. There's going to always be change. So just embrace it and just move on. Um, then there's this set of values, which really I think are more like the kind of, we need to affect some cultural shifts and cultural change that have to be heavily iterated. And so what we had for a very long time was, um, actually one of my favorites was everyone does the dishes, which is just a statement of, don't leave messes for other people to clean up. As you get bigger, 
sometimes you end up hiring somebody who does the dishes. I mean, it's kind of like where, you know, where, where things like having test engineers and QA comes into play, or literally a person who does the dishes. Um, because your office mates are like having a bunch of roommates who you see eight hours a day. Um, so some other, some other quick tidbits. Uh, and I'd say like a lot of these things work as well for software engineering as for management. Um, that's mostly what keeps me alive. Uh, is that, OK, fill fast and iterate. I think everyone has seen this. Um, I think uh, the way that I've been, I've been saying it recently has been, the better is the enemy of the good. And I think that's one of those phrases that tends to be misused. Um, it's not saying don't seek the better. It's saying don't prematurely optimize. You don't necessarily know what better is yet. You just know that there's a good solution. You should just strive for it and get it done. Um, I, I, you know, I, I used to have the rules of engineering, kind of joke set of rules, up on the uh, up on my wall next to next to my desk. And one of the ones that really stuck with me is this notion of like 80% solutions. Seek the 80% solution because that last 20% is actually probably another 80%, and there's usually another 80% after it. And this is why things are always late. Uh, and so, um, you know, don't even get me started on the fourth 80%. So it's like you're always going to be trying to find the next, the next thing to fix. Um, and so you get this, like, kind of quality of time curve, which is going you know, to flatten off pretty rapidly. So kind of hit that knee is where I'm kind of going here. Um, this works for processes as well. Um, a process is like a program run on people, and people are really, really crappy Turing machines. Uh, they're going to, you know, this is why you have to distill things down in very simple, simple ideas, especially the broader the audience, the simpler the idea. Uh, and so... You know, with processes, though, since you're, you can think of it as software running on your company, a broken process is going to have huge implications for the way things operate and how quickly you can execute. Um, and also keep in mind that with processes, the optimization is very difficult, right? The, the, the iteration time is very long. The, uh, the substrate is really poor, a bunch of people. And you don't actually necessarily know where you're going. You just know there's a bunch of problems you're trying to deal with. So this kind of comes back to my point of, Minimum viable, pro viable process. Like, try to find out what will solve the problem and move us forward. Um, should also kind of call it the fact that mentorship itself is a value that has to be kind of instilled. Um, we always talk about mentorship, but until you actually make it a part of the process, you won't actually do it. Um, I mean, I think in our case, what we try to call out is the fact that leadership, mentorship is part of leadership. Staff engineers for us on our IC ladder are as much about leading as they are about writing code. Right? They have to affect change but through their actual work and through an example. And so I think even like the phrase I see is kind of a really unfair misnomer. No one's really an I see like an individual past a certain point in your career. You can drive really hard to being senior, but being staff and above, you have to kind of work with people. Um, and really, just as we get bigger, mentorship is more important, right? Because you have to actually put, put time into it. It's easier to get lost in the crowd. It's easy to not know what the outlet is for mentorship. And so making it part of the culture is the key point here. Um, time is money. So this one is um, an outcropping of actually meetings are very, very expensive. The bigger you get, the more you need to have meetings because you need to coordinate. However, you should think of a meeting as being a place where everyone in that room is not actually doing the work that they were hired for. They're paying costs for communication. So clearly stating the purpose of the meeting you're having, clearly talking about why you're there. Um, as a manager, it's useful to you to stay informed, but just remember you're effectively taxing your people by, by having that method. Um, and they're, they're decidedly not for entertainment value. I've met people like this who like to be periodically entertained or like, come in and amuse me for the next hour. Um, it's, not, it's not your job. Um, and so you know, last point here really is that you know, values are about commitment. And in the time is money method, you know, thinking, values are about investment. So what you're trying to do is kind of short circuit ways to get the idea across that is kind of like the, the cheapest and most efficient way. Um, and so you know, in our case, broad, you know, values need to be broadcast. Our main method for doing so is things like all hands. And all hands, by my previous rubric, are literally the most expensive things you can do as a company. You're pulling everyone into the same place, sometimes flying them out. And the reason why you spend that time doing kind of very big kumbayas and discussions is because that's your only opportunity to do that and to actually have everyone in the same place hearing the same things. Um, and of course, everyone's going to take their own piece of that away. Uh, and I'd say that, um, you know, remember also that, that with values, culture is kind of intrinsically self-reinforcing um, for good or for bad. So if you do mess up your values, you have a chance to fix it, but there's going to be kind of a hangover period to get them in place. Um, and I think the last thing is when it comes to mentorship, something that's not said enough is that teaching, teaching a topic improves the teacher as well as the student. Um, making mentorship a part of the culture is going to make, make your engineers and you better. Um, so I think if the main takeaway I want to leave you all with is that Stay strong, managers. I believe in you. Uh, it's a tough road. And uh, thanks for listening to me for these 15 minutes.
Thank you.